the book of Judges, chapter 6 is where we'll be today. And uh, going through our yearly reading plan through the Old Testament and going to preach from our reading from this morning, or maybe you'll be reading this afternoon. I'll give you a little preview. Uh, Growing up, I had a friend of mine uh, who is a great, great guy, and he followed in his father's footsteps to go into the military. And he went into the army and went into uh, special forces in the army, became a Green Beret, and then he went and served in Afghanistan. And uh, served bravely, fought heroically in Afghanistan until uh, he was injured with a gunshot. And a uh, shot went through his neck. It entered into his neck along his hairline. Now, I don't have a hairline, but you can just imagine. (laughs) Went in through his hairline, and then it came out the other side of his neck. The doctors had no idea how he was still alive. They did not know how he could possibly not be dead. But Jacob, he knew how he was not dead, that the Lord had protected him. What happened was that that bullet went in through his neck on one side and it weaved and it curved and it missed every major artery, every major, uh, it missed his vertebrae, it missed his uh, spinal cord, it missed everything in his neck when it should have hit all of it. And so Jacob knew that it was the Lord that had saved him. He could actually, for a long time, that wound, the exit wound, he could stick two of his fingers inside of his neck. Jacob fought heroically. Jacob was and is a brave man of God. Now, just a few years ago, we had a team in Honduras and we had been out working in some more remote villages, just like you saw the picture of last year, but we're out working at some remote villages and then we came back to near the airport for our final night to get ready to fly home the next day. And so we got to this new hotel that we stayed in that was near the airport and as we, uh, I was, I'll just be honest, I was exhausted. I was just super tired from uh, a week of teaching. That may not sound like much, but teaching all day long every day, it is so enjoyable, but it's a little bit exhausting. And so I just really wanted to make sure I slept good this last night before we got ready to travel home. So I went to my medicine bag and I got some Benadryl out. <laughs> and I took some Benadryl before I went to sleep that night. So I was just absolutely out. I was sound asleep until... I think it was about 3 a.m. in the morning, all of the sudden I was woken up by just these loud blasts, just so loud, just boom, 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 boom. And I just jumped out of bed. I was like, what in the world is going on? And I'm telling you, I was half asleep, drugged up on Benadryl, half asleep, but I thought, I was like, there is a gunfight that is going on in the courtyard of our hotel. And I'm thinking, Lord, what do I do? Well, is, is the team okay? Is this real? Am I awake? Lord, I, I don't have any weapons. I'm just standing here in my underwear. What do you want me to do? <laughs> it turned out to be fireworks. <laughs> but two very different stories. Two very different examples. One example of bravery and heroism. And one, let's just say a little bit more on the fearful side. How do you handle fear? How we overcome our fear? I can tell you firsthand, it's not by taking Benadryl. (laughs) That's my excuse at least. But how do you overcome fear when it comes to obeying what God calls you to do? How do you fulfill the Lord's call for your life with courage and with bravery? Now, there is a famous story in the Old Testament where uh, in the book of Judges where we're studying, uh, where a man named Gideon, God used Gideon to win this incredible battle. God dwindled down his number of troops to 300 troops from 32,000 that had come, dwindles it down to 300 to take on what history says about 135,000 enemy. And they win. They win the battle. It's an incredible story. And so normally when we think about Gideon, we think about this brave conqueror. We think about this man who was a brave deliverer of the nation of Israel. But Gideon didn't start as a conqueror. He started as a coward. But God transformed him. And the title of the message this morning is From Coward to Conqueror. From Coward to Conqueror. 
So Joshua has led Israel into the promised land and now the various tribes, they've been given their inheritance and so now they're settling into the land uh, in these different areas that they've been given. And Judges chapter two, verse eight, says Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in timnath in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. And then listen to this. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. So after Joshua dies, the nation of Israel begins being ruled by these judges. Now these judges weren't like our courtroom judges like we might think of today. These judges were more like military leaders or political leaders for normally for their specific tribes. But if you read the book of Judges, the whole book is about how things just spiraled out of control how the Israelites continue to rebel against God and then God sends his judgment, allowing them to be oppressed by another nation. But we see these glimmers of hope where God has mercy on his people and he raises up a judge to deliver his people in spite of their rebellion. But each time that the Lord does that, the people rebel again and they restart this cycle. And that's where we pick up this morning. Judges chapter six, let me uh, read verse one and then we're actually gonna look at uh, starting in verse 11. But Judges six, verse one, it says, the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord handed them over to Midian seven years. And so it's in that context that the Lord raises up this unlikely hero, this man named Gideon. And so this morning, I wanna give you three steps to how God moves people from cowards to conquerors from the less familiar part of the story of Gideon. So the first step is that God calls you. God calls you. Let's look at Judges chapter six, verse 11. It says, the angel of the Lord came and he sat under the oak tree that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abbaiz right. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, valiant warrior. Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? And where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about? They said, hasn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I am sending you. He said to him, please, Lord, how how can I deliver Israel? My family's the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the youngest in my father's family. But I will be with you, the Lord said to him. You will strike Midian down as if it were one man. And then he said to him, if I have found favor with you, give me a sign that you're speaking to me. Please don't leave this place until I return to you. I let me bring my gift and set it before you. And he said, I will stay until you return. So the Israelites have been oppressed by the Midianites for seven years, and God, in his incredible grace, decides to deliver his people once again. And God calls the man Gideon for the task. Now, the angel of the Lord, it says, comes and meets with Gideon. Now, some of you are in the uh, Wednesday night class that I've been teaching that I've been thoroughly enjoying. I hope you have too. uh, Called Jesus in the Old Testament, the appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament. We've been studying how Jesus is all throughout the Old Testament. He's not just in the New Testament. He's all throughout the entire Bible. The whole Bible is about him and he's in all of it. And we've been studying lately about how the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. The angel of the Lord is Jesus. So it's Jesus who comes to meet with Gideon. But Gideon doesn't realize exactly who he's talking to until later in the story. And so when Jesus comes to Gideon, Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. Now typically you thresh wheat on a threshing floor. And typically a threshing floor is located out in the open and typically it's on top of a hill to allow the breeze to help separate the chaff from the grain. But Gideon is threshing wheat in the wine press. Normally, you press wine in the wine press. And typically, a wine press was at the bottom of a hill to make it easier to get the grapes down to the press. Listen to me, Gideon 
is hiding. Gideon is not courageous. This is not brave. This man is being controlled by fear. Now, Gideon could hide from the Midianites, but Gideon could not hide from the Lord. But look at the first thing that the Lord says to Gideon. It's almost humorous. Jesus calls this man who is hiding like a coward, he calls him valiant warrior. Now, this doesn't seem like a valiant warrior to me. Now, I'm guessing Gideon in that moment started looking around to see if someone else was there. You can't be talking to me. Because he knew he was hiding. He knew that he was afraid. But Jesus wasn't joking here. There's a little bit of irony, but he's not joking. He wasn't referring to what Gideon was. God was referring to what he would become. This is a word of encouragement. This is a declaration of who God was promising Gideon would become. But before the Lord called Gideon, the Lord saw Gideon. Jesus saw Gideon hiding but he saw past his fear, he saw past his cowardice to what he knew Gideon could become. I hope you hear me this morning, God sees you. God sees you, he knows your fear, he knows your doubts, he knows your past. And he sees through all of that to what he wants you to become. He sees your struggles and your weakness and your sin, but that doesn't stop him from calling you. What Hagar claimed, what she proclaimed about God back in Genesis 16 is still true today. You are the God who sees me. God sees past your current state of weakness to what he wants you to become. And so Gideon hears, the Lord is with you, valiant warrior. But he responds with questioning and doubting. And instead of confessing his sins to the Lord, he blames God for abandoning them when it was them who abandoned God. But the Lord shows grace to Gideon. He shows grace to him and he responds with his accusations. The Lord responds with a call on Gideon's life. He says, I am sending you. You're my man. You're gonna deliver Israel from the Midianites. And Gideon responds again (laughs) to this encouragement from the Lord, this call from the Lord. He responds with excuses about why he can't do it. And then again, the Lord is gracious and encourages him with a promise of his presence and also with a promise of victory. But Gideon is such a coward, he still, this isn't enough for him. Then he asks for a sign, give me a sign. Gideon was skeptical, Gideon was cynical, Gideon was weak, he was cowardly, but God called him to deliver the people anyway. The Lord doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. The Lord was starting a work in Gideon's life and we know when he does that, he promises to see it through to completion just like in Philippians 1.6. God was calling Gideon and he was promising to make him into this valiant warrior warrior from the scared coward that he was. That's like, that's just how the Lord works. The Lord loves to use the weak. He loves to use even the cowardly so that he receives all of the glory. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 26 says, brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one, no one may boast in his presence. So if you feel inadequate today, If you feel weak, if you feel afraid, take heart. God is calling you anyway. God is sending you. God wants you, even in your weakness, even in your doubts. Listen to me, he's already taken into account all of our stupidity and he calls us anyway. He still wants to use us. You see, some of the greatest feats in all of the Bible were accomplished by weak people who felt that they didn't measure up to the call. Moses had a stuttering problem. Jeremiah claimed that he was too young to speak. 
David was just a little shepherd boy with a sling and a stone. The disciples were sinful and really just absolutely ordinary men. Paul was a persecutor of Christians. God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. So here's my question for you this morning. What is God calling you to do? Now there's a few things I can tell you I know God's calling you to do. God's calling you to follow him, to follow Jesus. He's calling you to love him with everything you are. He's calling you to love your spouse sacrificially. He's calling you to lead your family. He's calling you to make disciples. And maybe this morning God's calling you to take a step out in faith. Maybe God's calling you to take a risk for him. Maybe God's calling you to have a gospel conversation with your neighbor that you know the Lord's told you to do it, but you just haven't done it. Or maybe this morning God is working in your heart to call you into full-time ministry or to call you to the mission field. Ask the Lord right now, Lord, what do you want me to do? What are you calling me to do with my life? And whatever that is, surrender to it because Jesus is worth it and he will equip you to do it. So number one, God calls you. The second step in how God moves people from cowards to conquerors is God prepares you. He prepares you. Look at Judges, let's pick up the story in verse 19. So Gideon went and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from half a bushel of flour. He placed the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot. And he brought them out and offered to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, take the meat with the unleavened bread, put it on this stone and pour the broth on it. So he did that. The angel of the Lord extended the tip of his staff that was in his hand and he touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire came up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. And when Gideon realized that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, oh no, Lord God, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace to you. Don't be afraid for you will not die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is peace. It is still in Ophrah of the Abbaiz rites today. Now, Gideon must have started to think that there must be something special about this man that he's having this conversation with because the food he prepares, if you study it, it wasn't just human hospitality. It's not like, hey, just let me get you something to eat. This was an offering to God that he was preparing. And so the angel of the Lord graciously goes along with Gideon's request for this sign. And then he does something miraculous. The offering is miraculously consumed by fire, even after the broth is poured on it and it comes up from a rock. And then the angel of the Lord disappears. Finally, Gideon realizes just who he's been talking to. He now knows that this is the Lord himself. Gideon knows that he has had an encounter with the living God. And Gideon realizes his mistakes. He realizes his foolishness. He knows that he has seen the Lord of all and his sinfulness has now been revealed. And he knows that he deserves to die. But once again, because our God is so gracious and so merciful and so abounding in love, the Lord responds with yet another word of encouragement. But this time, hear me, this time, is different. This time, the message from the Lord actually sticks. Gideon finally responds with faith. And he proves it by building an altar to the Lord and calling it the Lord is peace. So here's the question, what's different this time? What's changed? I'll tell you what's changed. Gideon knew that he had an encounter with the living God. That's what changed. He finally saw the Lord for who he is and he finally responds with repentance and faith. And he turns from worshiping these idols, worshiping these false gods, and he displays his new faith by building this altar to the one true God. This was Gideon's salvation moment. Gideon finally believed. Listen to me, if you are here today and you have never truly believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, today is the day of your salvation. 
The Bible says that if you turn from your sin and you trust in Christ, that he'll save you. God saves sinners through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. You can turn from your sin and be saved today. This encounter that Gideon had with God started a process of transformation in Gideon. God was preparing him for his calling. Do you realize that every single thing that happens in your life, everything, God is using to prepare you. He's using it to prepare you for what's next. So what is it that you're going through today? What struggles do you have? What battles are you facing? Have you lost a loved one recently? Maybe you just got a diagnosis or maybe you're battling through a disease. Maybe you have family problems. Maybe you have problems at work. Hear me, God is preparing you. Romans 8, 28 says that we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That means that God is constantly working every single detail in your life together for your good. Now that doesn't mean that everything in your life is good. It means that the Lord has the divine ability to work even the bad things in your life for your good. God works everything in your life to make you more like Jesus to prepare you for the call that he has placed on your life to accomplish what he's given you. No trial is squandered, no tears are wasted. It's all working together. Have you ever noticed how some people, the longer that they are together, the longer a married couple's been married, that they actually begin to look a little bit alike? (laughs) You ever noticed that before? (laughs) I think they've been studying it back uh, since the 80s. But there's some truth to this, that people begin to look like each other. There's even social media accounts where they like try to fool you, whether it's a sibling or whether it's a married couple, because you can look so similar after time. So you can have a couple who gets married and they look nothing alike. And then you fast forward 20, 30, 40 years, and all of a sudden they look very similar. (laughs) Scientists have actually put a name for this and think that they understand at least part of what's happening. It's called empathetic mimicry. What that means is when you have a strong bond with someone, you begin to have empathy with them. And so when you have conversation, when you interact with them, your facial expressions begin to match. And over time of matching facial expressions, you know what happens? The facial structures begin to be the same. That's how people begin looking like each other after so many years. It's the same principle for us becoming like Jesus. You see, Gideon's life was transformed because he saw Jesus, and we're the same way. We are transformed when we see Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of God and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is spirit. You become like what you behold. You become like whatever you're focused on. And so the more you focus on Jesus, the more you begin to look like Jesus. And so every time you encounter the Lord, you come away more prepared and more like Jesus than you were before. And if you wanna move from being a coward to being a conqueror for Christ, then you absolutely must encounter God on a regular basis in his word. Charles Spurgeon said, half of our fears arise from neglect of the Bible. John Newton said, the best advice I can give you, look to Jesus, behold his beauty in the written word. Your daily devotion time, if you're doing it, I hope you are, but if you're doing it, it may seem sometimes that it is uneventful. It may even seem mundane sometimes, but God is using it to transform you. He is using it to prepare you. There is no greater part of your day. There's not a more important part of your day than the time that you spend personally with the Lord. So God prepares you by growing you, by maturing you through encounters with him, just like he did Gideon. 
So look to Jesus, behold him, and he will equip you for the work. Number three, God calls you, God prepares you. The final step in how God moves people from cowards to conquerors is God strengthens you. Let's pick back up in verse 25. It says, on that very night, the Lord said to him, take your father's young bull and a second bull, seven years old. Then tear down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Build a well-constructed altar to the Lord, your God, on top, of his, on top of this mountain. Notice now, it's the Lord, your God. Gideon has changed. Take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood from the Asherah pole you cut down. So Gideon took 10 of his male servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was too afraid of his father's family and the men of the city to do it in the daytime, he did it at night. When the men of the city got up in the morning, they found Baal's altar torn down and the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the, and the second bull offered up on the altar that had been built. They said to each other, who did this? And after they made a thorough investigation, they said, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. Then the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son, he must die because he tore down Baal's altar and he cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, would you plead Baal's case for him? Would you save him? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If he is a God, let him plead his own case because someone tore down his altar. That day Gideon was called Jeroboam since Joash said, let Baal contend with him because he tore down his altar. All the Midianites, listen to this part, all the Midianites, Amalekites, and people of the East gathered together, crossed over the Jordan and camped in the Jezreel Valley. Here comes the battle. The spirit of the Lord enveloped Gideon and he blew the ram's horn and the Abiezrites rallied behind him. These men that were about to kill him now rallied behind him. He sent messengers throughout all of Manasseh who rallied behind him. He's also sent messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali who also came to meet him. Gideon starts as a complete coward. God calls him, God prepares him, and now we see the Lord strengthening him. And so God tells Gideon, hey Gideon, you know what I want you to do? You know that altar to Baal that your dad set up in the backyard for your family and for the whole town? I want you to go tear it down. That Asherah pole beside it, cut it down. I want you to make an altar to me there. I want you to make an altar to the one true God. Replace it with the correct altar. So before Gideon could take on the Midianites, he had to first confront the idolatry within his own family. And so Gideon's actions were an absolute ultimate insult to this false god. Baal was actually portrayed as a bull. And what did Jesus tell Gideon to sacrifice? A bull. He told him to take the wood from the Asherah pole, which was another false idol that uh, was related to Baal, and to use it for the wood for the sacrifice. God sent a clear message through Gideon. God said, I will have no other rival." I will have no other equal. These false gods are nothing before me. And even though Gideon still battled through his fear, he did it at night because he was afraid still, this is his first step showing that the Lord is strengthening him and making him into this conqueror. Then the men of the town come and they come after Gideon, but it's his father Joash that is there who comes to his defense. Remember, it's Joash's, it's his altar that he built, that Gideon has torn down. It's his idol. But Joash is so impacted by his son that he denounces Baal as a false god. He says, Baal, if, let him contend for himself. If he's a real god, he doesn't need you coming after my son. Let him do it on his own. But here's the question. What strengthened Gideon to go against his father, to go against his family, to go against the entire town? Where did this come from? I'll tell you where it came from. It came from the presence of the Lord. It was the presence of the Lord. It was God's presence is our power. And his power is the means by which we accomplish the mission. And so before you fulfill your calling, you may have some idols that you need to take care of in your life. What idol do you need to destroy? What idol do you need to replace with an altar to the living God? Now, you may be thinking, well, I don't have any idols of Baal. Like Hindus, they have some idols. I don't do that. 
But you know, in terms of the scripture, anything you love more than the Lord, that's an idol. Anything that you value more than the Lord, that's an idol. Anything that you focus on more, anything that you're more passionate about, those things are idols. Smash the idols, tear down the altar. So God strengthened Gideon for destroying the idols, but then comes the big test. Verse 33 says that the Midianites, it wasn't just them, the Amalekites and the people of the East, they all gathered together. And so now it's time for battle. And this battle is even bigger than Gideon was expecting. Remember Gideon's thinking, hey, it's just the Midianites, and now all these other people have come too. But Gideon blows the horn, and he spreads the word and 32,000 soldiers rally behind him and assemble for battle. Now you can read tomorrow in our reading about how God miraculously gives them the victory. But think about this, can, can this really be the same guy? The same guy who was threshing wheat in the wine press? He seems totally different. Now this guy has the spiritual power to back up this title of valiant warder. It's the Lord who strengthened him. And he went from faithless coward to fearless conqueror who delivers the nation of Israel. And then if you look in Hebrews chapter 11, it's called the hall of faith, the heroes of the faith. In verse 32, you know whose name you find there? Amen. Gideon. You find Gideon's name. How in the world did Gideon make such a transformation? How does Gideon become such a great warrior and conqueror? Well, the key is in verse 34 in Judges chapter six. It says, the spirit of the Lord enveloped Gideon. I love that word. If you study the the background of it, it kind of means like the Lord put Gideon on like a suit. The Lord put put him on like a suit. It was the Lord working through Gideon. The spirit of the Lord came on Gideon But listen to me this morning, church. The spirit of the Lord dwells within you. Romans 8, 11 says that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. So don't insult God by saying, God, you can't use me. God calls us, God prepares us, God strengthens us. He is the one who brings the power. So if you feel inadequate, Maybe you do today. Maybe you don't think that you have enough faith. I'll share with you a quick story that I heard D.A. Carson tell. There's two Israelites. They're in the land of Egypt. It's the night before the Passover. We'll just call them Smith and Brown. Those are very Jewish names. (laughs) Smith and Brown. And so Smith says to Brown, like, hey, are you, you nervous about tonight? Are you nervous about all this? And Brown says, no, there's no reason to be nervous. God told us through Moses what we're supposed to do. Do you take the blood of the lamb? Do you sacrifice the lamb and take the blood, put it on the doorpost? I mean, that's all you gotta do. You do that. Did you get the Passover meal ready? Did you follow the instructions? You got all your stuff packed up, ready to go because we're gonna be free? So Smith says, well, of course I did that. I'm not an idiot. Of course I put the blood there but things are so crazy, like all of these plagues that have been coming. And now this, this threat of this angel of death coming and the firstborn's being killed, like you got three sons, I only have the one. I love my boy, I don't want him to die. I trust God, but it, it's just, it's crazy. I'm just nervous about it. And Brown says, bring it on. I trust the promises of God. That night, the angel of death swept through the land. Here's the question, which man lost his son? Which man lost his son? The answer is neither, neither. Because death does not pass over them on the basis of the intensity of their faith, but on the grounds of the blood of the lamb. The weakest, faith in, the weakest faith gets the same strong Christ that the strongest faith gets. How many times do we ask God, God, do you still love us? God, do you still, uh, can you still use me? After we've done such dumb things, such sinful things, such rebellious things, even after being Christians for years, what are you gonna say to the Lord? 
well, God, I, I tried hard. I did my best. It was just, just a bad moment. Just a lot of bad moments. No. I have no other argument. I have no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Yeah. It's not the intensity of our faith that saves, but it's the object of our faith that saves. We overcome by the blood of the lamb. Yes. This is the basis of all acceptance and all assurance before God. It's all because of Jesus. It's only by the blood of the cross. God is at work no matter the level of your faith. God doesn't need you to be strong. He wants to be your strength. He wants you to trust in him. The Holy Spirit makes even the weakest man supernaturally strong. 2 Corinthians 12, nine. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may reside in me. Amen. What's the Lord calling you to do today? What's he calling you to do? Do you feel inadequate? Remember, the Lord is not looking for your strength. He's looking for your reliance on him. It's him who strengthens us. And just like God took Gideon from coward to conqueror, he can transform you and use you to do great things for his glory. Maybe you're here today, and like I mentioned earlier, maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. I wanna invite you, in just a moment, we're gonna stand and sing. I wanna invite you to come forward when we sing. Just come, I'll be at the front right here. You come forward to me and just say, hey, I need, I need Christ, I need Jesus. And we'll take you into the counseling room over here and just have some people talk with you about what the Bible says about how you can cross over from eternal death to eternal life. Amen. And then for all of us who are Christians here today, God desires to use us. He desires to envelop us like he did Gideon and to do great things for his kingdom and his glory. Surrender to the calling that God has put on your life and trust in him for the strength. If you need to use this stage steps as an altar, you come and do that as we sing. If you need to get right with God, you do that as we sing. If you need to join the church, you come do that. If you are saved but you haven't been baptized, you could come and make an appointment for that. You do whatever the Lord calls you to do as we sing. This will be our response time. Not only for those that are lost, this is for you to come forward for salvation, but also for us as believers to respond to what the Lord is speaking to us. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for the story of Gideon. Lord, thank you that you took him from being an absolute coward to Lord being a great conqueror. But Lord, we know that it wasn't something special in Gideon, but Lord, it was you. Lord, you are the one who did it through him. And so God, we desire for you to use us to do great things in and great things in Fayette County, great things to the ends of the earth. Lord, for you, for your name, for your glory. God, we love you. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone lost that needs to be saved, Lord, may today be the day of their salvation. Lord, give them the boldness to come forward in just a moment as we sing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.